What's going on guys? So behind me I've got this giant hardtail mountain bike. I've just had the Andy Kirby wheel kit turn up in the post. The kits always turn up with this box that's behind me that has the wheel controller display and throttle in it. The battery always turns up separately. That's completely normal. Yeah, so I haven't got the battery yet today, but what we're going to do is go into a little bit more detail about how I go about fitting the electric hub wheel what I use and what I don't use in the kit because I've got my own way of doing it. But I'm just going to take you guys in and show you in a bit more detail what I do, what to avoid and stuff for those who are interested in seeing what's involved in fitting a 2000 watt hub wheel to, which will fit the majority of hardtail mountain bikes if I'm honest. So let's get straight into it and see what's in the box. Right then, so let's lose some of this protective polystyrene crap. Right, the bike behind me is a 29er, so a 29 inch wheel. Absolutely fine with a 29er, obviously ordering a 29, obviously. But also you can get away with a 27.5, what a lot of people call mullet setup, where you've got one size smaller on the back wheel, that's totally fine. For some reason I appear to have the wrong gear cassette, that might have been a mistake on my part. This has got a 9 speed on here, and I've got 8 speed on the bike. With the Kirby bike kits, this the standard wheel, if you don't buy the upgrade, if you don't buy the 9 speed or whatever upgrade, it comes with a 7 speed free wheel I believe. Anything, well you only get 8 and 9 speed maximum on the 2000 watt because you can't fit 10 and above. So hopefully this is a 9 speed cassette and that's an 8 speed cassette. I'm going to have to switch out this uh, cassette, it's no, it's no huge deal. Um, if you do make a mistake and order the wrong free wheel or cassette, most bike shops or you can learn how to do it yourself via YouTube, it's no big deal. Just gonna open some of this up to show you the rim. Right, this is it then, this is the, uh, this is the upgraded MTX rim. I think it's a uh, double walled rim, so it's a bit stronger than the standard one, plus the rim is all in black. I much prefer these, but things to bear in mind if you have the standard wheel, which has got a silver and black rim, the standard wheel um, the standard wheel works with any type of brakes, but the MTX wheel, because it's got a chamfered, beveled edge, doesn't work with V-brakes, which, to be honest, you don't really want V-brakes with a 2000 watt kit anyway, because it's not really going to have enough power. So, most important part of the uh, wheel kit, obviously, being the hub wheel. This little bag is quite important, gives you a few little uh, cable ties. I know you've got about six or seven cable tyres in there. little block for connecting up the cable to the back wheel. It's always a good idea to have some extra cable tyres. I go through absolutely shit loads of cable tyres. I've got a thousand cable tyres in that packet down there. But that's what I bought myself, that don't come with a kit. So that's something you definitely need. Inside this little box you've got the controller, which I tend to just unplug everything that's plugged into it comes with a few things plugged in already, I'll just unplug all the plugs. There's a little button to squeeze, everything should all come off nicely. Here's your controller, that's your, that's your standard KT controller, we're going to put that to the side. Wheel controller, in the box you get a couple of grips, I've got to be honest I never use them, I think they're crap, but it is what it is. If anyone needs them, you're welcome to use them. Right, all of this gum for mess are some brake sensors. If you feel like you want to use these, it's up to you. I never bother. So that can go in the bin as well. Same for the pedal assist. I don't personally bother with that myself. It's up to you if you fit that. So then, that just leaves you with the thumb throttle, the display, which I'm, I'll, I'll show you that later. 
Talk arm comes with every kit. Controller bag. This is another thing that I never use. Yeah, as I was saying, I never use these these controller bags. The number one problem that I have seen from my own experience is people just not watching the temperature of the controllers, hammering the bikes, leaving the controller in a zipped up bag on a hot day and just hammering the bike and never checking the temperature and these overheat. They're not, they're probably the cheapest part of the kit to be fair, but it's always a pain in the ass when your controller melts and overheats. My own personal experience and suggestion is to fit these externally. I buy a much smaller bag that's neater just to hide the cables in. Um, and I find that works well for me, but again, it's up to you how you install your kit. So I'm, just, I'm just showing you how I do mine and I find what works for me, really. Other than that, just your, um, your charger. Don't panic if you ain't got your battery at this point. Batteries normally turn up within up to a week, a couple of days, a week after the kit. The reason why the batteries always ship separately is because they're classed as dangerous goods. There's a lot, it's a lot more complex to send batteries. There's not as many couriers that will send the battery. They go through more checks than the wheel kit does because of the uh, dangerous nature of batteries and the possibility of sort of fires and explosions. It's totally normal. Your battery turns up a little bit later, so again, just plan ahead. Like today I'm just going to sort the back wheel out, hopefully today I'm just going to get this wheel swapped out with a hub wheel so half the work, you know, half the battle's already done and I'm going to show you in more detail than usual what goes into changing the back wheel over to the 2000 watt hub wheel. Coming in for a closer look, after I've thrown away the bits that I don't use we're left with the 2000 watt hub wheel. In this cardboard box here you've got the charger. In this cardboard box here you've got the display. Little bag with the hub wheel connector block in it. The controller itself. Here you've got the thumb throttle. There you've got the torque arm. And then you've got a bag full of spacers. And that's it, I don't, I don't mess around, I don't bother with the brake sensors, I don't bother myself with a pedal assist. You're cool, it's your build if you want to fit those things, that's up to you, but this is what I prefer and the way I prefer to build my bikes. As I said before, I seem to have made a mistake and ordered a 9 speed cassette on this wheel. And on this bike it has got a Shimano 8 speed, which I believe it's an 8 speed, which looks a lot nicer, so as long as I can get my... Um, tool over the um, as long as I can get my tool over the axle of the electric hub wheel I'm going to switch these out and put the Shimano on the e-bike kit it's a slightly better cassette and it's in black which this build's going to be all in black and grey which I think will look great talking about things being in black and matching I tend to take the standard controller and give it four coats of four coats of hammer right direct to rust spray so don't know if you can see that difference I prefer to have my controllers mounted externally and colour coded black that's just a personal preference and something I do to my bikes I wouldn't use anything thick on there this is spray so it's quite thin it's not gonna make a huge difference to the temperature of the controller I definitely would be painting it in anything like thick you know so you can help with uh, heat disbursement still so that's what I do it's just a personal preference as aesthetically I think it looks way better so the first thing we're going to do today and it doesn't matter which way around you do it to be honest normally sometimes I put the battery on first but as the wheels turned up today we're going to go for the wheel obviously you're going to be removing the standard back wheel that's not motorized off the bike whichever one you're basing your conversion on we will be in this case we'll be using the cassette you don't have to change a cassette if you order the right cassette with a, it will come ready mounted to the hub wheel if you buy it from Kirby bike I'm going to be switching that cassette over today I prefer the black Shimano um, it's no big deal if you get a tool and look on YouTube how to do it it's fairly straightforward you make sure you use the um, the things that you do need off the wheel is the inner tube the tire and the brake disc pretty much every time because you know it obviously don't come with a inner tube and tyre because everyone, every bike has a different size and style tyre and you can usually just supply the one off the bike that you do the conversion from obviously if you've got one in poor condition 
I'd advise it's a good time to get a brand new tube and tyre. But it's fairly straightforward, most new mountain bikes is a fairly straightforward swap over. Make sure the disc is a six bolt style if you want it to fit. You get a centre lock type disc which are less common than you get the six bolt disc. They're more common, they'll switch straight over to the Kirby bike kit. If you have got a centre lock one, you're going to need to buy a brake disc. Other than that, it's a quick release, should be fairly straightforward. So we're going to whip that wheel off now and start getting the bits we need off of it. Alright, so this is the uh, donor bike. And this is the standard six bolt pattern, there's six bolts around the edge. That's most common. If you find you've got a centre lock type disc, you will have to buy your own brake disc. For most people, that shouldn't be an issue. So, I've stolen the uh, cassette, which isn't always strictly necessary. And always taking the brake disc on the conversions that I do. The conversion kits never come with a disc brake. Try not to get your fingers on the disc brake, because if you've got a brand new bike to do the conversion like me, it's very easy to get an annoying brake squeak. Fingers in the centre and I put it down the same way to pick it up to put it back on the other wheel. Whilst right, so we're here, I might as well steal the inner tube and tyre, and then this wheel is surplus to requirement. Another good tip that I want to add as well is it's helpful to check the wheel direction before you take it off, which is normally from the gear or the cassette side, it's normally clockwise, so it's always helpful to take note of that or remember that for making sure you don't you don't want to get the whole way through fitting the whole back wheel to realise the tyre's on the wrong direction. You'll notice on the tyre when you zoom zoom into a bit of it that it's got a little arrow and the road. Most tyres are rotational, so just double check that before you switch it over. Once you get to this stage, fairly easy. Tube out. Tyre to the side. And there we go. There's a little plastic spacer underneath the um, these bolts here, you have got to, got to, got to make sure you take this plastic spacer off. I can't explain the amount of times that I've first done these builds and left this spacer in and I had nothing but nightmares trying to get the brake caliper to stop rubbing. It completely sets off the alignment. Every time I've done a build it completely screws up the alignment of the brake caliper. Right, this little thing here, this little thing here, this little spacer must come off. It will cause you all ends of night types of nightmares. If you leave it on, make sure you remove that when you build your DIY kit. Right, so one other thing that I want to point out, a lot of people seem to email and ask questions about thinking there's something wrong with the wheel. They installed it right, they get the spacing right and the wheel is just tight and it doesn't spin very freely. I would say nine or 10 times out of 10, it will be because these three wires are touching, yeah? If you separate these three cables, the wheel will spin freely. The reason that is, it, it causes regen braking. So even, it baffled me when I first got into it because I thought, well, it's not plugged into a battery, so how can it be regen braking? I don't know the technicalities of it, all I know is that if any of these cables touch, it's not a problem, it's not doing any harm per se, but when you fit it to the wheel and you try and spin it in the frame to see whether you've you know, mounted it correctly, it will be really tight. And as soon as you separate this green, yellow and blue cables, the wheel will spin freely. So make sure that you're not thinking there's an issue when there isn't. With the axle on these, the diameter of this part is going to be thicker than what standard, like the standard dropout size. Don't worry about the size of the axle because these flat edges are the same diameter as the dropouts. This will fit into most dropouts on a mountain bike. So the majority of aluminium framed mountain bike dropouts are going to appear like this. That flat slot is going to fit in there without an issue. As long as you've not got a carbon frame that's got like a, a, a circular closed dropout. It needs to have an open dropout so you can drop the axle into this bit. You shouldn't have any issues fitting it. As long as you make sure it's all the way down in the slot, shouldn't have an issue at all. The other thing I want to mention is I tend to, because you can see there's two flat edges each side of this which drop into the dropout slot. 
I tend to make sure I rotate the wheel until the cable is following the direction of the frame if that makes sense like I won't I won't drop the wheel in so the cables exiting backwards because obviously you want the cable running down towards wherever the battery and controller is on the bike so I tend to rotate the wheel round and that's the direction that I'm going to fit the wheel in. Now before that we're going to talk about spacers. This seems to be a problem for a lot of people. Um, this is how I do it. Like I said, any, anyone wants to do it a different way that's totally down to them. I tend to fit the spacers on this side. I just tend to fit one so that it drops into the dropout. So this spacer, so this spacer on the inside will fit and drop down a little bit into that slot just makes it a little bit more snug and secure on the inside. So this is it on the brake this side. We've got the slot here, the cable's going to run this direction. This washer's going to go on like that so it drops down into the dropout. That's it. That is this side done. One spacer and one spacer only. I just like it so it protects this cable a little bit. And that's that. That is as simple as that. Right, this side, the cassette's on. This is where I see a lot of people running into issues. Some people fit really big washers that are bigger than the diameter of this uh, cassette and it clamps down onto the cassette and they wonder why they've got problems. Your washers have got to fit within the diameter. See that? It goes within the diameter of the, uh, of the cassette. And I keep fitting these See that one's actually touching the, the uh, cassette, so that's no good. I don't want that touching and preventing that cassette from rotating. So I'm going to take this one that's a smaller diameter. Now, we need to get to the stage where this is protruding. If you look down on this, if you look from above down, the washers are protruding slightly past where the cassette is. That's all we need to get to, okay? It's got to be at a point where it's passing the uh, cassette and at that point I will match the, uh, the washer of the other side that sits within the, um, sits within the dropout. So if you see on both sides from above the, the, the washer has got the little notch in it this side and the same this side so it should all drop nicely in there. The only time I would add any extra washers onto the brake this side is if when you fit the caliper, the back of the caliper on a very rare occasion will be rubbing against the outside casing of the electric motor. It's quite rare for it to happen but occasionally it does and at that point I would just slip in you know like a washer behind, I'd slip a washer in behind it to bring the, to space the caliper out. Nine times out of ten though, I find that just one space of that side is plenty enough. So we've got one space of this side, the cables going in the direction of the bike, that should just drop straight down into that groove. And the same this side, we've got um, the washers sitting within the cassette, so they're not touching it, they're not clamping the cassette down, and that should all slide relatively nicely into place. I have a plastic mallet for once it's in the dropouts I like to give a little tap without damaging the thread to make sure it's seated safely within the dropout. So at this point, right at this point I find it much easier to put this heavy wheel in with the bike upside down. There's two things I'm doing if you look here I'm going to line the disc up so it slides between these brake pads. Do not squeeze the brake in at this point because it will just clamp the pistons in so You've got that slot. I'm going to be lining up the disc to slide in there and I'm going to be extending these gears up and trying to drop the cassette onto this part of the chain. So it's a little bit fiddly but... So look at this bit where the cassette is. I'm trying to drop the cassette in at the same time I'm trying to wiggle the... Uh... It's not easy. <laughs> there we go, it's starting to get there now. Sometimes I find it easier if you come and look to get my thumb, um, be careful not to trap your fingers but I'm going to get my thumb on, push 
with my thumb to push the wheel in and to pull the frame out. See? Alright, so that's getting there. I'm going to check this side. Ah, see that side? This side is pretty much all the way down. If you see the bottom underneath, that's lovely. That's how I want it. Normally I would come in a little tap just to make sure once it's in. And have a look from above. This is what I was saying about the caliper. Can you see that looks like it's almost or it is touching the caliper. Can you see? So at this point, I'm going to come in, do what I said before, put an extra additional washer in, and then this washer, and then reinstall it. Got to make sure that is tapped down really safely at the bottom. Now if you come above and look at the gap, now you will see that there is an actual gap between the electric hub wheel and the caliper. As long as you've got that, that side is perfect. Right, so whenever you're fitting these, I like to make sure I've got a rubber mallet so I can move this out of the way and tap on the axle until it's fully seated in the dropout. You really need to be careful. A lot of these dropouts are just about deep enough to securely fit the wheel if you don't get them fully at the dropout on most of these modern bikes. You see a lot of people where they say, oh, the back wheel fell off. It's because they're not bothering to fit the wheel properly. Nine times out of ten, they're just not, yeah, just not sitting the axle fully in the dropout. If you look, if you look underneath this one, you can see I've tapped that underneath till that axle is sitting within the dropout, and the top of that thread is flush with the top of the dropout. Same the other side. It's much easier on this side. Give it a couple of taps, and you can see that that is sitting safely. This cable, like I said, is now in the direction to be mounted along towards the controller. And, as I was saying before, if these cables touch, it creates regen braking. So if I spin that, I need to adjust the gears, spins fine. If I touch these together, look at that. See that? Now if I let go of these, if I separate them, touch them, stops. So that is effectively causing regen braking if you touch these phase wires together. So don't email the person you bought the kit from saying there's something wrong with it, it's not spinning. Just make sure these wires are not touching. Right, this is what you get in the torque, in the torque arm kit. Get two pieces like this, one nut, one bolt, one washer, a spacer and a jubilee clip. I tend to go to the brake disc side um, and just depends on the dropout and the style of the bike. See, luckily it's just clearing that otherwise that might have been an issue. I, I mean you can mess around with this if you want to spend more time, like perhaps you could drill a hole in here. Ideally, if you wanted to, and put a solid bolt in, so you haven't even got to do a Jubilee clip. But in this instance, I'm just going to fit it that way round. What I like to do is, I like to have the, the bolt and washer at the back and the Allen key at the front. And I'll show you why I do that. So I'll fit it this way round. Nut and washer at the back, Allen key at the front. The reason that I do this is, Put this back on there, that's going to go like that, is when it comes to tightening this up I can put a pair of pliers on the nut at the back and an allen key at the front. It's much easier to do it that way than trying to get like an L-shaped allen key at the back. So I'll show you that quickly. Right, so I'm just going to, I'm not going to do this up fully, I'm just going to make it so it's, so it's sort of stiff and got some rigidity, just to hold it in place. The other thing you've got to make sure is see this bit, as this turns, it's not going to get in the way of the wheel nut. You've got to make sure the edge of this wheel nut isn't going to get clamped down. Some angles you can do it at end up, you know, the wheel nut ends up like over the tool arm. You don't want that, you don't want it sitting over like that. So make sure you can get the, the wheel nut on. 
In fact, I'm probably going to have it there. That looks about good. Double check the Jubilee clip fits nicely. Undo that. Put it through. Squeeze it together with two fingers and start threading it back through. In fact, I might put it through the other way actually because that would be difficult to do up once it starts getting tight. So I probably want it to go through this way. That's going to be a lot easier to fasten up from this angle. I will get the Jubilee clip on first. It takes a long time to get it all the way done up, but it's almost there. Obviously make sure if you're doing it this side that nothing's touching the brake disc, nothing is at this point. That Jubilee clip's nice and tight. You can come in, sometimes I'll come in and take a little bit of the, uh, sometimes I'll come in and bend the uh, Jubilee clip and take a little bit of it off. Sometimes I'll choose a spot and think, I don't need that excess, and snap it off, bend it, tides it up a bit. So that's all good there. Now I come in, pliers on the back. Can you see how hard it would be? Can you see how hard it would be to get an Allen key in the back? That's why I put this bolt on the back, Allen key on the front. Nick that up. Now all I need to do is come in with some adjustable spanners and do the wheel bolts up and that should be all good. We'll use a 19mm spanner for a change. Right. Take your little wheel cover cap. Let me put one on. Yeah, I'll put one on. Put one of the wheel cover caps on there to tidy it up. One on here. Right. Get your free zip tyres that come in this little bag. Right, see here, obviously I don't want that touching the bolts for the disc or the disc in any way, shape or form. So I normally try and find somewhere pretty close and might get a decent zip tie in to pull that away from the disc first of all. I'm probably going to utilise one of these bolt holes. Do another one here. I'm going to try and follow this cable up and tie it onto this existing cable at that point here. Let's keep it nice and tidy. I'll probably put two on there to keep it super tidy. I'm going to push the uh, Rotate the uh, zip tie around so you don't see that connection. One more here. I build a lot of these, you don't need. If you're just doing one for yourself, you probably won't need. This is overkill, but I go for a lot. 1,000 zip ties off Amazon, job done. And you can use as many as you need. Just basically, at this point, making sure Nothing's going to catch or get in the way of the wheel. So I'm probably just going to get to this point, zip tie it to here, and then I'll take care of the rest of this cable when I come to do the uh, controller. What I'm going to do now is come in, be very careful when you cut these, not to cut into brake lines, your existing cables. Be super careful when you're cutting the excess off your zip ties because you don't want to go to all this effort and ruin your kit by cutting through a cable. I'm just going to cut off all these tail ends of these zip ties. Push that round underneath. And that, apart from the gears and the radio needing a little bit of a tweak and adjustment, that is the back wheel one. I'll flip it up the right way so you can see how it looks. No. 
tall arms fitted. Tall arm fitted here. Wheels done up tight, pumped up. As you see, when I did it, the spacing's done in a way that it's not gonna. The spacing's done in a way where it's not gonna be an issue. There's a gap here between the motor and the caliper. Sometimes that can be an issue. If you find the caliper is touching the motor and scratching it, then you need to immediately put in an extra washer and see how that goes. Yeah, and that's it, guys. That is how I fit uh, Andy Kirby 2000 watt wheel on pretty much any hardtail mountain bike. People will have their own ways of doing it if you want to fit the brake. Uh, the brake centers, torque arm, totally up to you. Personal preference, this is how I do it. This bike is now ready to have the controller and accessories fitted, the throttle, the display, which I'm going to do in the next video. But I'm hoping you found this helpful and I'm hoping some of the tips will help out some of you guys that have not done this before. Yeah, and that's it. So don't forget to like, comment and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And we'll see you guys in video soon. Take it easy. Hello.